Many creatures roam the lands of myth, but few of them can compare to the lords of the sky and land, the Griffin. Hard Eagle, Hard Lion, and wholly awe-inspiring, the Griffin has been around for millennia as a mythical creature amongst various civilizations. From divine protectors to symbols of nobility and a god-given right to rule other men, Griffins have inspired many valorous and greedy deeds of mankind. But what's the story behind this noble beast? How many forms did it have throughout history? And how crazy are some of its origin theories? I'm your one and only host, Reptilicus, and I'll join you on this adventure where we discover the origin of the griffin and how it inspired humanity throughout the millennia. When it comes to the origin theories of griffins, we've got two theories to work with here. First, the extremely obvious one, which is so obvious it would poke your eye out with its beak or claws, and it focuses on symbolism. The lion, Pantera Leo, was extremely widespread in ancient times. There's evidence that lions could have been the most widespread big mammalian predator for a very long time since the Mesolithic. Every major culture around the Eastern Mediterranean and Central Asia had contact with lions in one way or another, whether it was direct or from importing lion hides and decorative items. A picture of strength, fury and nobility, it's no wonder the lion inspired many mythical creatures and in this case half of the griffin. The other half belongs to another symbol of nobility and deadliness, the eagle. Eagles had extensive migratory routes as well as home ranges, so if we're going by a logical conclusion, we could assume the Eastern Imperial Eagle, Aquilea Helaca, and Steppe Eagle, Aquilea Nipalensis, were the basis for the other half of the griffin. Their historical range was obviously bigger than their current range, and if we're just looking at their migration pattern, we can clearly see that they were very much present in the major griffin origin areas. If we combine one and one, instead of two, apparently it equals a somehow functioning weird hybrid monster. Now about the second theory. This is a giant wild card, which I'm personally very fond of, and you can probably guess why, even though it's much less likely. And it centers on my absolute favorite thing, dinosaurs. Nowadays, Ceratopsians are a well-known dinosaur branch thanks to pop culture. Everyone's heard of the Triceratops, right? Or the Styracosaurus? Pachyrhinosaurus, anyone? Okay, fine, I'll stop. Ceratopsians had a Central and East Asian origin based on fossil finds during the Middle Jurassic with their current oldest known ancestor, Yinlong, appearing in China some 170 to 160 million years ago, and it's hypothesized that they would lay a partial foundation to the griffin myth of the Scythians. Smaller species such as Protoceratops or Psittacosaurus are quite common in Central Asia, especially the areas where Scythian gold was mined from, and some people hypothesize that their skulls, due to an obvious mystique around them and their giant beaks, could have been a part of the inspiration behind griffins. I'd personally throw in that some oviraptorid skulls with small or non-existent crests such as Han could also work as an inspiration. Apparently, even the ears in the Scythian griffin can be explained as the broken frills of a protoceratops skull, or even the wings if you're crazy enough to believe that. We'll talk about this later in the video, but Scythians were infamous for the amount of gold artifacts they produced. It would make sense for them to come up with a territorial monster that would also end up protecting gold and dissuading anyone else from coming to steal some of that sweet Scythian cash. No matter which fantastical or practical theory you believe, griffins are firmly rooted in archaeological artifacts. The earliest archaeological evidence we have of griffins comes from Iran and Egypt. We have known griffin depictions from the city of Shush, aka Susa, showing up around 3000 BC in the Proto-Elamite period, the first real civilization in Iran. It was known as Shirdal, and it spread across the entirety of the plateau, and it endured for many millennia in the region as a symbol of hope, happiness, prosperity, basically good vibes only. There was an old Persian belief that if a shadow of a griffin fell over you, you would find true happiness, and that's a pretty good start, right? Griffins are commonly found in the artwork, from the Achaemenid area and even into the Sassanid area and beyond. It's truly an iconic animal for the Persians. 
Griffins also appear in Egypt. It's believed that they had a clear connection with Horus, as most depictions show them with a falcon head, almost the equivalent of the Hieracos Sphinx appearance-wise, with the exception that the griffin had wings. The first reliable artifact that shows Egyptian griffins is the so-called two-dog palette, which is dated between 3000 and 3100 BC. Another example is the ceremonial axe of Pharaoh Amos I that was given as a gift to his mother, Altep II. As we can see on this fascinating ceremonial axe head from the 16th century BC, there's a clear representation of a griffin at the bottom. This axe was dedicated to the victory of Pharaoh Amos I against the foreign Ixos enemies of Egypt. The griffin's position on the axe clearly marks him as a symbol of the Pharaoh, as well as his Ka immortal soul. As you can see, even though we don't find griffins as often in Egypt, they still serve a very valuable purpose when they appear. By the second millennium BC, the griffin spread across the entirety of the Levant and Middle East. It also found its way to the Minoan civilization on Crete. We find depictions of griffins fighting bulls and other animals around 1700 BC, and the throne room in Knossos, the currently oldest known throne room ever, has griffins all across its walls. But once again, the griffins role is the same. They are noble protectors, as well as followers of the goddess Britomartis. They're even shown as to be uh, <clears throat> suckling on our breasts, you know, uh, goddess of nature and stuff. Yeah. The Minoan Griffin spread to mainland Greece, and it is the most common depiction until the 7th century BC, when new ideas from Central Asia start taking hold. And for this, we have to blame the Scythians. The Scythians, or Skuda, as they are supposedly reconstructed in their language, were an Indo-Iranic-speaking nomadic people that at their greatest cultural extent stretched from the Carpathian Mountains all the way through Central Asia to the western borders of China. Now, let's get something straight. The classical Scythians, known to Western literature and used in a broader academic sense, were Iranic people. But their cultural and military influence across the steppe was extremely high during the early to mid Iron Age, so they ended up including a lot of closely related or non-related groups. Nomadic tribes have a cultural ebb and flow. When a dominant power arises on the steppe, for the most part, it culturally assimilates other nomadic tribes with obvious exceptions. They will keep their rituals, beliefs, general ways of life, self-identification, which even outside Western sources could see, but they get assimilated through art. We can see a massive spread of Scythian art style in everything from jewelry, weapons, clothing, saddles, you name it. The Scythians would culturally also end up including a decent part of Proto-Uralic and Altaic people in the ranks, which is evident in locations such as parts of Siberia or Mongolia. The Eurasian steppe was just a giant melting pot of people, and that's enough about that. The Scythians left such an influence that even long after their eventual displacement and assimilation into a multitude of other peoples, we have Byzantine and some other Western sources calling various Turco-Mongolic people Scythians. Scythian artwork commonly includes animals, ranging from horses to dragons to antelopes to the hero of our story, the griffin. They were extremely popular, as we can see from a multitude of archaeological artifacts all over the Eurasian steppe and beyond, and they were all of a similar appearance with the classic Leonine body, eagle head, wings, and some pretty kawaii ears. Sadly, we currently do not have any confirmed Scythian writings, so we don't exactly know the complete meaning of the griffin to the Scythians, however, if the jewelry is anything to base it on, they are often depicted as brutally killing animals, so... Yeah, you can guess that they were pretty savage. Scythian gold artifacts eventually found their way from Central Asia to the Greek colonies along the Black Sea and into mainland Greece. And following them were also stories of the griffins. Fierce beasts that were extremely territorial. As if they were guarding something. The father of history, Herodotus, wrote about the abundance of gold in Scythian lands and the lengths a certain tribe went after to get it. But in the north of Europe there is by far the most gold. In this matter, again, I cannot say with assurance how the gold is produced, but it is said that one-eyed men called Arimaspoi steal it from the Grips. 
The most outlying lands though, as they enclose and wholly surround all the rest of the world, are likely to have those things which we think the finest and the rarest. The Arimaspoi are another Indo-Iranic group of peoples that appear not only in Herodotus' account of the story, but they were mentioned in the lost work Arimaspea by Aristeas. Now, before we get into the Arimaspoi, let me tell you something about Aristeas of Proconesus. He is one of the reasons why we know of the story of the Isidones, Arismapoi, and the Griffins. According to sources, this 7th century Greek was uh, <clears throat> touched by the gods. Apparently, his soul could leave his body at will and he could get possessed by the god Apollon. He entered a shop in his home island of Proconesus where he suddenly felt a little bit uneasy, I guess, and he died. Instantly. The shopkeeper left to tell his family and there they saw a person who just came back to the island, which said he just saw Aristeas on the road to Kizikos. Of course the family didn't believe this, so they went to the shop and didn't find his body. No one found Aristeas. This Aristeas, possessed by Apollon, visited the Sidonis. Beyond these lived the one-eyed Arimaspoi, beyond whom are the grips that guard gold. And beyond these again the Iperboroi, whose territory reaches to the sea. Except for the Iperboroi, all these nations, and first the Arimaspoi, are always at war with their neighbors. The Isidones were pushed from their lands by the Arimaspoi and the Scythians by the Isidones. So this guy randomly vanishes from the island of Proconesus and appears in Central Asia close to the Tarim Basin, Altai Mountains and the Zhongar Gate, all of whom are essentially Kazakhstan, Mongolia and Western China, where he spends some time interacting with nomadic tribes, gathering information on various peoples, even the mythical Hyperboreans who could have lived in Northeastern Asia. He comes back home seven years later and writes a now lost poem about it. To make things even crazier, he vanished again after writing it and appeared 240 years later in Metapontum, which is located in South Italy. He commanded the populace to build a statue of him and an altar dedicated to Apollo as Aristeas was traveling together with Apollo ever since he died as a sacred raven. So, I guess he was a max level wizard or he was tripping on some serious Scythian herb. Would you really trust anything this guy said? The Arimaspea did not survive except one passage which was recorded by Longinus in De Sublimitate. A marvel exceeding great is this withal to my soul. Men dwell on the water afar from the land where deep seas roll. Wretches are they, for they reap but a harvest of travail and pain. Their eyes on the stars ever dwell, while their hearts abide in the main. Often I ween to the gods or their hands are praised on high, and with hearts in misery heavenward lifted in prayer do they cry. Anticlimatic, isn't it? Now I want you to take a moment to think about the gigantic distance the story of the Griffins and these various peoples traveled. From essentially western China to Greece. It almost feels like what Aristeas did was real, right? Take a deep breath and take it in. Let's get back to the nomads. Of these two then, we have knowledge, but as far for what is north of them, it is from the Sedonas that the tale comes of the one-eyed men and the grips that guard gold. This is told by the Scythians who have heard it from them, and we have taken it as true from the Scythians and call these people by the Scythian name, Arimaspoi. For in the Scythian tongue, Arima is one, and Spu is the eye. The Isidones were another group of Iranic-speaking peoples that were close to the Scythians, yet distinct enough for Herodotus to mention that fact. According to the sources, they lived further east than the Scythians and north of the Masagete, another Saka group. This would place the Isidones in the Tarim Basin. Talk about distance. They were reported to have had ritualistic cannibalism just like some other Saka tribes, and to explain it, deceased elderly males would be stripped of flesh, eaten, and their skulls would be gilded and venerated as a ritual object. And that's pretty metal, isn't it? They were driven away from their old homes by the Arimaspoi. Written sources of the legendary Arimaspoi placed them at the foot of the Ripaean Mountains. Some say those were the Carpathians, but come on, let's be honest. That's a bit unlikely considering everything we've discussed so far, the Altai Mountains and the Zhongar Gate area are much more accurate placements. 
The Aramaspoi were always at war with their neighbors and especially the Griffins because apparently you have to be extremely greedy if you're willing to risk your life by fighting a giant flying eagle lion that could just rip you apart without any problem, right? It seems as if they were often successful due to the abundance of Skiffy and Gold artifacts. But what about their one eye? They were no Cyclopean beings, it was just a linguistical error and a bit of fan fiction from Herodotus, which later writers such as Travon and Plinius the Elder keep. The Greeks obviously heard the name through Iranic sources where Ariama, love and Aspa, the word for horses, mix. The Greeks understood it as Arima, one, and Spu, I. So that's why we have Cyclopean looking Scythian relatives fighting griffins. It's still cool, right? We don't have access to many Greek sources about griffin activity that didn't involve their ancestral homeland war with the Aramaspoi, however, what we do know is that they also symbolized wisdom. They could be found as temple guardians and were sacred to Apollon. They even pulled as chariots. Now that's a fancy ride. Griffins were also reported by Greek writers to live in India, although we get some contradicting sources on what they were actually like. Ilion in the 2nd century AD describes griffins. Their feathers along the back are black, their neck feathers are dark blue and those in the front of the body are red, while the wings are white. According to the locals, they also didn't guard the gold, they just happened to nest there and they fiercely guarded their young. They would take on any animal without any issues except the elephant or the lion. And the native populace would just wait for a nightfall and then they would collect any gold that would fall from the nests and make it home safe after a few months. Easy money, easy life. Philostratos says that griffins are sacred animals of Helios as they pull his chariots. They will attack lions without any issues as they have a flight advantage over them. They will attack elephants and dragons, essentially gigantic snakes too, but they avoid tigers as they're apparently as swift as the wind. This version of griffins doesn't even have wings, instead they have a short powered flight thanks to webbed membranes on their palms? What? Is this even a griffin? No matter what, at the end of the day, Thanks to skypho hellenic syncretism, the griffin's appearance has been firmly established and the fascination for the creature did not wane. If anything, it grew throughout the ages. Griffins are extremely prominent in the medieval times and beyond. They appear everywhere. Manuscripts, architecture, or even as water jugs. Even Dante Alighieri wrote about griffins. You just couldn't avoid seeing a griffin. Okay, you could, but where's the fun in that? The griffins are extremely important for heraldry. They appear in so many motifs and they represent bravery, strength, nobility, loyalty, wisdom and even cunning. A multi-talented beast that has proven without a doubt that it did deserve to be immortalized across humanity's various cultures. So how does the griffin compare today? Once again, they're absolutely everywhere. From movies to video games, books, you name it, they're everywhere and they're still appearing in coats of arms. Pretty cool, right? The griffin has stood the test of time, without a doubt, and it continues to fascinate people across the world. Truly a legend worth of remembering. Try not to steal any gold after this video, not because you're gonna get arrested, nobody really cares about that, but because you'll probably get mauled by a griffin. Here's a list of some more historical stuff if you want to read about griffins. There's not that much information from classic writers, but if you want something more fringe or in-depth, just feel free to message me and I'll try to hook you up with some good griffin stuff. And there we are, at the end of this episode. I hope you liked this, I hope you enjoyed it, and trust me, I had an amazing time making this, it was a lot of fun, and if I made even one person more interested in mythology, all these kinds of stories, if I made you more interested to even get crazy enough to go dig for gold in the middle of the Gobi Desert and unexplainably die, then I guess my mission was successful either way. I inspired you, and that's what we strive to do here. If you like this series, I plan to do a lot more of mythology-related content, so stay tuned. If you enjoyed it, feel free to support in any way, 
everything is accepted and everything is appreciated. And if you would like to see a specific creature, story, or deity covered in a story by me, please write in the comments. I will decide something, and if I don't decide after the next video, I guess I'll just coin flip and uh, better luck next time. Anyway, that's it for now. And until the next time... Wait, um... Did you... Did you just hear that? No!